hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal endowed by their creator with certain Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Our fourth session. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here again and, and to continue our quest uh, for knowledge and, and better understanding. Um, I, uh, I just want to uh, give everyone a quick update uh, uh, about Mildred. Uh, you know, our fearless leader, Mildred Crump, is still recuperating uh, uh, after fracturing her hip uh, 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 close to three months ago. Uh, she's slowly but surely uh, gaining her, her, her health back, and, and, and we, we can't wait uh, until we welcome her back uh, uh, amongst us. But uh, for now, uh, it is my great honor and privilege uh, to welcome... Uh, a really special guest, uh, someone who's always intrigued me personally because he's been in a movement for his whole life, his entire life, and, he's, and he stayed with his uh, fellow citizenry in Newark. And over the course of time, he actually uh, has developed a name for himself and celebrity, yet what I always found interesting was he never once ran for public office, which is really unusual. Most people who gain the smallest amount of celebrity all of a sudden are, you know, are running for something. And he never did. And the, the, the way I view life, I, I always took that as, a, that as an incredibly meaningful thing. And, and so Larry's been in the trenches his entire life, voted. Uh, during the Kenneth Gibson era, he, he left Princeton University, came back home because he was needed, and I believe he became the youngest school board member ever elected in the nation at 24 years old. And you know we could go on and on, but uh, uh, the, the reason the, the reason amongst many that I'm so excited to have him here is the whole point of our program is to listen, learn, and then engage. And, and we have nobody better that, than we could, we could learn from than, than Mr. Hamm tonight. So uh, with no further ado, uh, I, I should just say, sorry, uh, the program, Ms. Mr. Hamm's gonna speak for a half hour or so, and then we'll open up to, to Q&A. So please, please stay with us and, and, and uh, get involved. Thank you so much, Mr. Hamm. Thank you, Eric. And good evening, everybody. And I saw my friend Max uh, give me a shout out in the chat. How you doing, Max? And uh, I'm very glad to be here with you uh, this evening. And I'm here to talk about the movement for the transformation of policing uh, in the United States. I just want to make one small correction 
to the very nice introduction that Eric gave me. And that is, I was appointed to the Newark Board of Education at the age of 17. I wasn't even old enough to vote. In fact, this July 1st will mark the 50th anniversary of my appointment to the Newark Board of Education on July 1st, 1971. Um, and I think that after 50 years, I still hold the record of having been the youngest uh, fully empowered voting school board member. I wasn't a student representative like they have with many boards of education. There'll be nine members on the board and they will let, they will let the students elect someone to be the student board member, but that person is really uh, a non-voting uh, member. I was one of the nine appointees to the Newark Board of Education. And as Eric said, I was appointed by Ken Gibson uh, in 1971. That was the result of a student movement we had in Newark at that time. And there was a a uh, teacher strike going on in Newark in 1971. It was up until that time, it was the longest teacher strike in the history of the country. I was a student at Arts High School and I was the uh, leader of the student government at Arts High School. And um, we had been informed that if we missed 35 consecutive days of school, we wouldn't be able to graduate. So of course, that upset many of the students, particularly those of us that were seniors who had already been accepted at colleges, many of us, uh, by March of 1971. And so on March the 24th, 1971, uh, was the day after much planning and discussion and organizing, uh, we had a walkout at Arts High School and I led uh, about 95% of the students walked out. Uh, we marched downtown uh, to the Gateway Hotel. Today, that hotel is named the Doubletree Hotel. It's the same exact building. It's right across the street from Penn Station in Newark. Uh, that's where the board and the union were having their negotiations. And we marched down there and, and about half of us, maybe 200 or so, of us got into the hotel and many of us got up on several of the floors and we sat in there and we stayed there until Mayor Gibson showed up. And that's how I, I met Ken Gibson. And three months later, he uh, sent his aide, one of his aides to my house and asked me if I would be a member of the board and I accepted. And um, at that time they told me, <laughs> The mayor told me and his, his staff told me, oh, you'll be able to go to Princeton and be a board member at the same time. You'll be able to do both things because even, even I knew at 17 that, you know, this would be a difficult thing to do. And um, I, I started at Princeton. I actually started in August of 1971, but by October, I knew that I had to uh, withdraw from Princeton in order uh, to fulfill my responsibilities as a school board member. So in the fall of 1971, late October, 1971, I withdrew from Princeton University to serve my three years out as a school board member. And I returned to Princeton in 1974 and I graduated uh, in 1978. But I mark um, March 24th as the beginning of as, as really my social justice birthday. I marked that day, the day that I actually took, engaged in some action to confront those in power as the beginning of my, my, my life as an activist, as my social justice birthday, March 24th. Um, but even that has its origins uh, in the issue that we're discussing tonight the transformation of policing, because it all goes back really to 1967. And many of you who are watching and listening know uh, 
about what happened in Newark in 1967. Some people called it the Newark riots. Uh, those of us who were in the movement, uh, we call it the Newark rebellion. And it was that night that uh, I sat with my family on our second floor, second floor apartment porch, you know, in Newark. Some of these houses still exist, these like three family wooden frame houses that have porches uh, on the second and third floor. You can sit out on the porch on a, a nice uh, summer night. And uh, on July 12th, 1967, we watched the flames rise to the skies in Newark, New Jersey. And that, that really was a nodal point in my development because I grew up in a family that was not a political family. Uh, when I say not political, I mean, my mother went to the polls. Uh, my father passed away when I was four years old. And when he passed away in 1957, my mother moved back with her parents, my grandparents. And so I lived in, in, a, in an extended family type situation with my grandparents, my grandmother's sister, my mother, and we had a, another adult cousin living with us, cousin Ralph. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we sat on the porch that night and, you know, I asked my grandfather why everybody was so upset why was all of this going on and that's when my grandfather who was from Gainesville Georgia started talking to me about racism in his own way not like in a college professor kind of way but my grandfather uh, actually started talking about his experience being in the army in World War One he's a World War One vet the encounters of, of racism that he had in the army and in the places in Europe uh, where he had, where he was stationed and where he had to go to fight and the racism that he faced in the South. My grandfather who was from the South hated the South so much that he told my mother that he didn't want to be buried in the South. In fact, his exact words to my mother were, Grace, if you put my body on a train and send it back to Georgia, I will get up off that train and come back here and get you. <laughs> That's what my grandfather, my grandfather hated the South. And if you saw him, you would know why. Those who saw the movie tonight, who looked at the movie about Emmett Till at some point, my grandfather looked like uh, Mose Wright. I believe that was his name, Mose Wright, uh, Emmett Till's um, uh, relative that he stayed with. My grandfather was a tall, uh, very dark black man. So I'm sure he got the worst of the Jim Crow system in the South. And that's why he did not even want to be buried there. He's buried today in the uh, in Glendale Cemetery in Bloomfield, New Jersey. He's buried in the veteran section where both my grandfather, who was a World War I vet, is buried and my father, Lawrence Ham Sr., who was a World War II veteran, he is buried there also. But the rebellion of 1967 started because of an incident of police brutality. Uh, Max has written, Max Herman uh, has written about this. And um, some of you probably know from experience and indirect experience and direct experience. But the police had a very bad reputation in Newark at that time. And they stopped um, John Smith at the corner, I believe it was Fairmount and Springfield Avenue, which was not far from the 17th Avenue precinct where they took him. And the 17th Avenue precinct was near where I lived uh, when I was a very small boy, before my father passed away, we lived on Ridgewood Avenue, Ridgewood and Avon Avenue, a number five Ridgewood Avenue, right almost at the corner. And the police precinct was about two blocks up on the um, corner of uh, 17th Avenue and Livingston Street in Newark, New Jersey. And that police precinct had a very bad reputation. It was said that if you went in there you might not come out alive. You would walk in there, but you would be carried out. And um, 
the police took uh, John Smith, the cab driver there, and they beat him up. But the rumor got started that he had been killed. And so people came to demonstrate. And, you know, it's very interesting. You know, we know the history of the civil rights movement in the South, but we really don't know the civil rights movement in the North. There were a number of civil rights organizations in Newark, New Jersey, uh, uh, from the from the beginning of the 20th century, believe it or not, the Newark chapter of the NAACP is one of the oldest NAACP chapters in the country. Uh, the NAACP, I believe, was founded in 1912, um, and the Newark chapter was founded only a couple of years after that. So you had the NAACP in Newark, you had CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, at that time in 1967, uh, there was even uh, the Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, they had a, a project, I believe it was called NCUP project. They were, they were there. There was all kinds of groups. And so there was a demonstration in front of uh, the 17th Avenue precinct. In fact, uh, Robert Curvin, who wrote extensively on, on this in his book, Inside Newark, uh, which I would recommend to everyone to read. I think it's one of the best books uh, on Newark and, and on that period and afterwards. Uh, there's a picture of Robert Kirvin, who was a core member at that time, a very young man at that time. And he was leading the demonstration. He got a bullhorn, he's speaking to the crowd. But that demonstration led to a confrontation with the police. And that was the fuse that that lit the bomb uh, that caused the social explosion in Newark. And most of you know the story. At, at first, the 1,300 member police precinct tried to put it down. I mean, police department tried to put it down, 1,300 members. Then they called in 700 state troopers. And then they had to call in uh, uh, 1,500 national guards. And uh, Governor Hughes had to declare a state of emergency. And, it, you know, we were under military occupation. You know, I can remember as a little boy, like the military, the, the, I, could, I could remember, it wasn't the first night, maybe it was the third night of the rebellion, the second or third night. I can remember the troops marching up 16th Avenue. I lived on 12th Street between 16th and 18th Avenue. They were coming up in those green army trucks in Jeeps in half tracks, <laughs> half track is like a little tank. You know, it's like a, a little, I guess that's why they call it half because it's about half the size of a regular tank, but it has a barrel on it, just like a tank and one person can sit in it. But they were like stationed right at that intersection and they went door to door to people's houses. You know, uh, when, when the state of emergency was declared, we couldn't leave our house for several days. And then when we left, Cars were searched going out, cars were searched coming in. I mean, it was something. But in the midst of all of that, literally not two weeks after the rebellion, there was a Black political conference held uh, right downtown Newark. I, I'm amazed when I, when I read about it, you know, because with all the military repression that was going on, it, it's just something that they were able to put together a, a Black power conference and I think it was chaired by uh, Dr. Nathan Wright. But I say all that to say that the rebellion in Newark was started by an incident of police brutality, but Newark wasn't the only rebellion. Every major city in New Jersey had an uprising in 1967. Um, in fact, before the Newark rebellion, I believe the Jersey City rebellion actually took place before the Newark Rebellion. And a, a little known fact is, and you can read this in Robert Allen's book, Black Awakening in Capitalist America, between 1960 and 1972, there were um, more than 1,000 uprisings, civil disturbances in the United States. Now, many of us know about Newark and we know about Detroit. Some might know about Harlem, which I believe was in 1965, 
But I don't think many people know that there were a thousand, like 1,000 <laughs> uprisings within a 10 year period in this country. And that's why so many people, you know, many people believe that we were on the verge of some type of revolution in the United States. J. Edgar Hoover believed it. That's why he wanted to stop it. That's why he uh, 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 created that program, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program, to stop the black movement, to infiltrate and disrupt black organizations, to quote unquote, prevent the rise of a black messiah, you know, in the country and on and on, the murder of Fred Hampton and on and on and on. You know, some of you probably saw that movie recently, Black Judas, uh, which was uh, related to the story of the assassination of Fred Hampton. And the reason I raised this uh, little factoid is that most of those urban uprisings were triggered by an incident of police brutality. I mean, to, to understand why there's such an uproar, and, and I know that many of the people, many of you who are watching tonight are very well-informed, educated people, probably up on your current events. Uh, I know you've had this uh, diversity series for some time, so you know about Black Lives Matter and, and, and so on and so forth. But what is happening today is really um, rooted in the origins of the police in this country. Uh, I know it might be hard for some to believe. I know, you know, I'm going to tell the truth. My consciousness has evolved over time. You know, when I was 17 and I led the walk out, I wasn't like, you know, a, a very aware, politically conscious black militant. <laughs> you know, I was a high school student who was really being driven uh, by uh, self-interest, <laughs> you know, uh, like many people don't know when Martin Luther King, when they had the Montgomery bus boycott, when they started out, they didn't call for the abolition of all of Jim Crow that they didn't know they, they had some very simple demands at that time. Like they wanted the segregated seating to end on the buses, but they didn't call for the destruction of the whole Jim Crow system. And that's how many movements start out. They start out with like very uh, uh, simple demands and then mm -hmm. evolve over time as people evolve, as their consciousness evolves, as their organization, you know, acumen evolve. They move on to make greater and greater demands and are forced to in many instances because many of these problems, you know, we look at them initially and think that they can be solved, you know, with, with, uh, a simple solution, and we find that they really can't be solved unless there's uh, systemic change. But, you know, uh, when I started out as a student, I, I give you a little example. You know, when, when I started at Arts High School, you know, in the fall of 19, uh, 1967, at, like, I didn't even think we were going to have school in 19, after the rebellion, after the uprising. I'm like, no, we're not going to have school. We probably won't go to school till next year. School started in September on the regular day. And they had freshman orientation at Arts High School. And, and all of you have been at some type of orientation, either in college or high school. And they all, they talk to you, the administrators and the teachers, they talk to you and tell you how great the school is. They usually invite the student government president to speak. So at that time, Arts High was still fairly integrated. Now it's predominantly black and Latino. But back then in 1967, I would say it was probably 50-50 or close to it, black and white. And uh, the student government president, uh, David Hammond, I still remember his name, he, uh, they asked him to speak. And they said, David, speak about, tell us all about the student council. So David started speaking, but he didn't start talking about the student council he started talking about the war in Vietnam. Now, I think I was 12 years old at the time. I would turn 13 in December. I didn't know where Vietnam was. Somebody tried, gave me a globe to look at and say, tell us where Vietnam is. I didn't know where Vietnam was. 
you know, but David started talking about Vietnam and he was talking some hard talk too. I think maybe he had a relative that had been drafted or something. And the principal stood up and said, David, stop talking about that. Talk about the student council. And David kept talking about the war in Vietnam. And we watched like the freshman, I'm like a kid. I'm watching the student government president and the principal fight on the stage in front of the whole school. The whole school was in the auditorium that day. But that was the day I knew I wanted to join the student council because it seemed like they were dealing with some heavy stuff, you know. But but get, just getting back uh, uh, to the situation, 1967, I mean, we to understand what's going on today, you have to understand the origins of the police and modern policing. And, and you can read there. There's a whole literature on this. But I found out by reading Herbert Aptecker's book, uh, Slave Rebellion in Colonial America. I did not know that one of the origins of the police in America was, in fact, uh, out of the slave patrols, even the Second Amendment that is touted by a lot of these gun advocates, these people who want everybody in the country to be armed, you know, and you're always talking about the Second Amendment, but the Second Amendment was really put in the Constitution to enable the Southern colonies to organize slave patrols. And slave patrols were a form of policing. And then, you know, uh, after the Civil War, as African-Americans began to leave the South and come North and began to leave the plantations and come into the towns, that's when towns and cities begin to form uh, police departments uh, as we know them uh, today. That's one of the origins of policing. And it's funny because in some ways, the police in the 21st century seem still to be an instrument of racial control. You know, one of the things that came out uh, when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson was that uh, Ferguson was a predominantly black community, but the police department was still like 85% white. Now, the reason this came as a surprise to me and perhaps to others was because we came through the black freedom struggle, the black power movement, in the 1960s, we remember when black people lived in a kind of apartheid type arrangement. And when the police were like a, a occupation army, you know, that's like it is in the colonial administration. You know, you if you were to go, go to Ghana in the early part of the 20th century, you would see British, white British troops in all black Ghana, <laughs> you know, or you might see Indian troops because the British Empire was worldwide, so they would bring Indian troops from India to Africa to fight Africans, you know. But the police forces in many Black communities were all white. The, the, the political administration was mostly white, but the population was mostly Black, you know. And it, it kind of surprised me that even today, well, this is, uh, I think Michael Brown was killed in 2016, might have been 2016 when Michael Brown was killed, that almost two decades into the 20th century, you had all black Ferguson with a predominantly white police force. And, and many people still say that the police are like an occupation army in, in our community. And in many ways, they be, they behave that way. And in many ways, you know, the police were an instrument of racial control. I mean, those of you who watched the Emmett Till movie, you know, when they showed the, they showed the people who were the victims of, of racism uh, in the South, they showed Emmett Till's family. But when you saw the sheriff, it was white. You know, in, in many of these films and in many of the history books, when we think of racial oppression, we think of the Ku Klux Klan and the white citizens councils and the, and the red shirt. You know, there were all kind of white supremacist groups. Most of us talk about the Ku Klux Klan, but there were other groups beside the Ku Klux Klan. There was the white citizens council and the order of the white camellia and the red shirt, all kind of white supremacist 
uh, uh, groups were operating in the South. But when you look at the civil rights documentaries, who is it that is moving against the civil rights workers when people are sitting in, who, who is called? The sheriff and the police. You know, who is putting the water hoses on the people? The police. Who putting the dogs on the people? The police. Who's beating the people? The police. So, you know, it's 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 a funny kind of, you know, kind of uh, 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 psychological judo <laughs> they do, you know, on our minds to make us think that the the main instrument of oppression was like the Ku Klux Klan, but the the Klan was just one of many instruments of racial oppression, and the police were one of those instruments of racial oppression. You know, the Constitution of the United States, you know, has a, a, a the, the original Constitution has a clause in it that talked about uh, the return of property. That they, they weren't talking about goods, <laughs> sir. You know, they, they were the property they were talking about were escaped slaves. That when slaves escaped the colonies or when slaves escaped their master, uh, colonies that didn't have slavery were bound to return those slaves. And, and this situation pertained right up to and through the end of enslavement, that the police were used as slave catchers to catch runaways and return them back to their masters. So almost from the beginning, you know, the police have been used as a tool of racial control. And, and that's not just in the South. You know, when we think of Emmett Till, we think of down South, right? We think of Georgia and we think of Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and these places. But Jim Crow wasn't just in, slavery wasn't just in the South. It's throughout the United States, in the Northern colonies, as well as the Southern colonies. Slavery was right here in New Jersey. New Jersey was founded as a colony in 1620. By 1625, enslaved African people were here in New Jersey, being forced to labor in the fields, being forced to build roads, being forced to build dams, to construct buildings, and on and on and on. And, and, and as I said, you know, we think of, of 1619 when Africans came to um, uh, uh, Port Comfort in Jamestown, Virginia. But a year later, 1620, this was all of this up here, New York City and surrounding area was New Amsterdam. It became New Jersey when the English defeated the Dutch and the Dutch had to give up many of their um, uh, colonial possessions, their colonies uh, to the English. So it went from New Amsterdam to what? New Jersey, Jersey was in England. So this became New Jersey, all these, Northeastern states were known as what? New England, you know? So from the beginning, you know, you gotta have, you're gonna hold human beings in bondage. You have to have some type of force, some type of armed force to do that. And the police uh, and slave patrols, all of these served as part of the instruments of force to keep black people under racial control. Um, uh, uh, during Reconstruction, and the period immediately uh, after the Civil War, uh, you had the Reconstruction uh, uh, governments, uh, and state leg state legislatures, you know, and in some places you were able to have black constables, and in some cities and towns you had black police. But do you know that those black police couldn't arrest white people? <laughs> this is true. This this continued into the 20, well, into the 20th century. And when, you know, cause you can go back and look at the newspapers and, and see some of the articles, you know, first black police officers um, hired, but those police officers could only arrest black people. They couldn't arrest white people. And so uh, th this situation, I remember talk, I, I mentioned to you, uh, my grandfather, right? And my grandfather would talk to me about the belief. And one of the things he said to me that I never forget is that he said, 
Bootsy, because that was what they called me when I was a little boy. He said, Bootsy, he said, the black cop will beat you harder than the white cop will. Now, this is what my grandfather told me when I was like 12 years old, right? And I really couldn't understand what he was talking about. But now I understand it because police brutality, we think of white cops and black victims. But many of the victims of police brutality have been killed or brutalized or had their rights violated by black officers as well. Right here in New Jersey, uh, we're fighting for justice for Abdul Kamal who was shot to death in Irvington, New Jersey, shot 15 times. The officers that shot him were black and Latino. You know, Earl Faison in Orange, New Jersey. Uh, he was literally tortured to death and by five officers that were convicted of conspiracy and civil rights violations. One of those officers were black. And according to the one of the depositions that was given in the trial, uh, given in the case, uh, it was the black officer paid who took his gun out and put it in Faison's mouth. Imagine that, putting the barrel of a gun in someone's mouth, saying, I'm going to blow your effing head off. You know, so we see in a lot of instances where the, the Black police and the Latino police, they have to overcompensate. They have to prove themselves to their fellow officers in blue, that they're not Black, that they're not, that they're blue, that they're not uh, Latino, that they're blue. And, and even with the women officers, you know, there have been black people who have been killed by female officers. Uh, I think of the, the young man that was just killed there in Chicago, Dante Wright. And he was killed by a female officer who was the, the, the training officer, the officer that was supposed to train the other officers, you know, on using their weapons and using tasers and so on and so forth. She killed him. So this situation has gone on uh, uh, for decades uh, in the United States. And, and somewhere around the 1960s, uh, uh, New York City um, uh, put in place a police review board. I believe that was 1966. As early as 1962, Black people in Newark, New Jersey were demanding a police review board. Um, they got one in New York City, but they never got it. They didn't get it in New Jersey. So New York established its police review board, I believe, in 1966. And for 50 years, more than 50 years, almost 60 years, people in Newark have been demanding a police review board. And finally, in 2014, after the election of uh, Ross Baraka, after the election of Ross Baraka, he put in place a police review board. He did it through executive order as mayor. And then the city council a year later codified it in municipal, in municipal ordinance and municipal law. And, you know, we the initial plan was for a police review board with subpoena power. But as soon as the city council uh, passed the ordinance, uh, to establish the police review board, the Fraternal Order of Police went into court to stop it, saying that Newark could not have a police review board with subpoena power. Now, this is very interesting because it's important to understand, and I think we have seen examples of this in the last few years, that the police are not just a military force or a paramilitary force, to be more exact. The police are also a political force. And people say, well, why has it been so difficult to uh, bring about changes in policing, changes in police reform? Well, it's because the police have, first of all, the police are a formidable force in the United States. The United States has the second largest police force on the planet Earth our police force is only exceeded by the police force of the People's Republic of China. The United States has a population of about 335 million people, give or take a, million, a couple of million. Uh, we have 800 sworn police officers and another 200,000 or so people that work in the administration of police organizations. 
the People's Republic of China has 1.5 million sworn police officers, but the People's Republic of China has a population four times the size of the population of the United States of America. Uh, they have 1.2 billion people. So on a per capita basis, we actually, relative to our population, we have more police per capita uh, uh, in the United States than do the People's Republic, although in, in absolute numbers, uh, their police force is, is larger. And uh, these police, they are very organized. They have national organizations. Um, many people are familiar with the FOP, Fraternal Order Police, PBA, Police Benevolent Association, the supervisory police, that is the, the, the management, you would call it, <laughs> in the corporation. That, that would be, I guess, the, the sergeants on up, or maybe if not the sergeants, at least the captains on up. Uh, they have supervisory police associations and all of these police organizations, they support candidates for office. They oppose candidates for office. They make political contributions uh, uh, to political candidates. Um, they lobby for legislation uh, that's going to help them. Uh, this is how the police have so much, uh, so many laws that give them protection from prosecution that the average citizen does not have. So they're not only a paramilitary force, that is men with guns authorized to use force against the civilian population, but they're a political force and they shape public policy and they shape laws uh, to benefit themselves. They have in essence become a power unto themselves. This is why we in the People's Organization for Progress, we say that the greatest antidote to police brutality is community control of the police. And this is why people have tried to establish police review boards across the country. This is why we're still fighting uh, uh, to get the police review board in Newark established. And um, like I said earlier, uh, the police took Newark to court uh, they won in Superior Court, Newark won in the Appeals Court, but the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey ruled that Newark could have a <clears throat> police review board, but it could not have a police review board with subpoena power. And so now there's a legislative push to get a law passed by the New Jersey state legislature. Uh, that, that bill is A4656. S2963, uh, these are the bills that would enable municipalities to have police review boards with subpoena power. And right now we're in a big push to try to get these bills passed. In fact, uh, we're going to Trenton. And those of you who can go with us, I'm inviting you. We're gonna have buses, a bus leaving from City Hall in Newark. We're going to Trenton for a rally on the state uh, on the uh, State House steps on Monday, June 21st. Uh, the rally in Trenton will start at 12 noon. Our bus will leave uh, from Newark at 11 a.m. And we're going to rally uh, and put pressure on uh, the legislature, uh, on the Assembly and the Senate to pass these bills that would enable municipalities to have police review boards with subpoena power. Uh, we're also demanding other reforms, like uh, right now there's a bill in that would eliminate qualified immunity for the police. This is why many police, you know, 99% of police brutality cases don't even go to trial. But of the few that go to trial, most of those don't end in the police have what's called qualified immunity. So while we have a police review boards bill with subpoena power, uh, we also are demanding the passage of a bill uh, that would eliminate qualified immunity for the police. Another bill that we're supporting is the bill that was initially sponsored by uh, Loretta Weinberg, uh, the um, records transparency law. You know, these police disciplinary records are 
uh, protected from public scrutiny. They even protected from uh, the scrutiny of other municipalities. Like if if uh, if a cop gets fired in one town, he can go apply for a job in another town, and the people doing the hiring in that town can't see his disciplinary record. So they're going to put a, a cop that might have a history of being a brutal cop and violating people's constitutional rights and worst case scenario, maybe even kill somebody. They won't know that record and they may end up hiring that person. So these are three bills uh, that we're asking people uh, to support uh, that are in the state legislature right now. Please call your legislators and say, vote in favor of the police uh, brutality uh, the police review board bill with subpoena power, the qualified immunity bill, and the records transparency bill. And the reason we want um, police review boards to have subpoena power because if they don't have subpoena power, they're really toothless. Subpoena power gives them the ability to call witnesses, gives them the ability to um, uh, request records and documentations in a case that will help them make the right decision. If they can't get the records, if they can't get the documentation, if they can't get the witnesses, then they really can't make informed decisions when these cases of police brutality are brought to them. Um, so we're asking people to come out and join us uh, in Trenton uh, on Monday, June 21st. Now, it's likely that the legislature may not uh, pass these bills this session. If they don't, the fight will continue uh, when they return uh, to the legislature, to their legislative sessions, uh, I believe in September, they take a break for the summer. But while we support uh, these bills for reform, as I said be before, we, we support um, police review boards with subpoena power. We support any qualified immunity. We support um, records transparency. We support police wearing body cameras. But I'm telling you, if people are not organized and mobilized to fight police brutality, those laws are only worth the ink that they're written with. Uh, I think all of you know, it's one thing to have a law. It's another thing to have the law implemented and, and activate it. And this is why we say we have to build this movement against police brutality uh, in, the, in this country. Um, I think it's not only a question of racial justice, I think it's a question of, of, dem of democracy. I think uh, one of the things that we saw uh, this past January, and you can look this up online, you can Google articles that appeared in the Star Ledger, it said one in five of the people that uh, were in the siege of the Capitol building on January 6th were in that insurrection. One in five were either police or military. Many of them still active. Some of them were retired. I think there's a real danger of uh, authoritarianism and, and right-wing fascism in this country. And I, and I think that uh, we have evidence that it has taken root, not only in our police forces, but in our military. Very dangerous situation. Uh, this is why we must have civilian control of the police, civilian oversight of the police, but we, we like to say community control of the police. So at this point, I think I have exceeded, uh, <laughs> well exceeded, the 30 minutes I promised to talk. So I will stop now and uh, we can dialogue and uh, have some uh, discussion. And I'll take, I'll try and answer some questions that you may have. Thank you Larry so much. Bro. That, that, that was amazing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to ask uh, Max Herman. Uh, we know about Newark, the Newark rides in Detroit because uh, our very own uh, Professor Herman, who is the uh, chair of the sociology department at New, New Jersey City University. 
<laughs> and a good guy and, and a friend, but but he's he's knowledgeable on the subject. I thought I thought perhaps uh, Professor Herman might be able to start off the Q and A for us. So uh, are you out there, Max? Yeah, I'm here. Um, thank you so much, Larry. That was wonderful. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things onto the history that that Larry was mentioning, and things that I only learned recently. That, um, well, first of all, this was the anniversary, the hundredth anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, which um, received a lot of a lot of press recently. There were documentaries on PBS and CNN, and it's important to remember that. Um, first of all, that began with an incident of a of a African American man being accused of of sexually assaulting a white woman in an elevator, uh, being taken to jail, and um, and a, a a group outside of the jail trying to take him out and lynch him, and that had it was something that had happened in several other cases in the South, but what was particularly telling about this case was that. Um, that the, the police deputized mobs of white people. They deputized them and allowed them to ransack the black community of, of Greenville in Tulsa. So here's another case where the, actually some of the, the suits right now, uh, and this was buried for over 80 years. All of, all reference to this event was, was taken out of the, out of the newspapers, a complete cover up. Um, and then people began looking into it and questioning it and asking for justice. And a part of the issue in the claim for justice is that the police and the government did not act in a neutral fashion, but instead aided and abetted the mob. Uh, the other thing that I learned more recently, I hadn't learned this before, um, a, a book just won the Pulitzer Prize this year about Wilmington North Carolina in, in 1898. I had no idea that this event happened. I'm supposed to be a scholar, but there are many areas where my knowledge is my, I have a lack of knowledge. And so I, I looked up this book and I read more about this incident in Wilmington, North Carolina. This is a case of political violence. This is very similar to the, the January 6th um, attack on the Capitol in the sense that it was, it was after an election and the election had seated an integrated group of city council people, black and white. Mm -hmm. And basically what happened is that, again, a mob consisting of some police as well, uh, decided that they were going to try to overturn a, a legally held election. And, um, and once again, the police were not a neutral party and once again, hundreds of black people uh, lost their lives. So uh, I just wanted to add those two historical events in there because they, again, they are part of a long litany of, of historical events. And Larry is absolutely right that almost every one of the quote, riots, rebellions in the 60s began with an incident of, of police uh, brutality. And Larry is also right uh, among many things that the effort to establish a police civilian review board stems all the way back to the early 60s with people like Robert Curvin um, and was consistently resisted by the, by the first by people in city hall and then by people in the, in the police in the city of Newark. So I don't really have a question except to, <laughs> except to kind of piggyback on that and encourage everyone to push for a, a civilian review board that has a real powers to, to hold police accountable. I, my only question, and it would involve New York City mayoral politics, which is probably not the right place for this, <laughs> is that Eric Adams, is, as a former police officer, is running for mayor of, of New York City. And he's a very interesting character because he says that he became a police officer because he himself was brutalized by the police and yet Eric Adams seems to be favoring some modified form of, of stop and frisk. So, you know, aside from just holding the police accountable, Larry, what kind of policing practices do you think would be best conducive to both promoting public safety and to preserving the civil rights of, of people in the city? 
Well, let, let me give you some, uh, some anecdotal um, uh, information. Uh, the People's Organization for Progress was founded in uh, 19... We actually were organized in 1982. And from the time that we were founded, we uh, raised the issue of police brutality. And we began really to actively agitate around that issue because for the first almost um, eight years or so of POP, our activities were mostly educational, like mostly indoors, you know, <laughs> like someone once said to us, "Say y'all got to come outside because <laughs> we would have forums and programs and we still do just like this. We have forums and we have programs to educate people. Education is part of organizing. But at some point, just like swimming, you can read about swimming, but eventually you have to jump in the water if you want to learn to swim. So we really, I think the first time we really became active uh, around the issue that has got involved in a particular case was the Philip Pinnell case um, in 1990. That's when Philip Pinnell was killed. So we were really focused on this issue from 90 all the way forward, right? And up until, I would say, uh, 2000, and 10, there were many, many police brutality cases in New Jersey, and there still are. Police brutality is not going away. <laughs> Even in Newark, it still exists. It's just not, uh, and this is the anecdotal uh, side of it that I'm trying to give you now. Um, there were many incidents of police brutality. And we used to, because the people couldn't afford lawyers, we used to refer people to the ACLU, but the ACLU didn't take individual cases. So they had a very, how are you? The, the ACLU had, a. Um, they, they didn't take, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted for a moment. They didn't take individual cases. They did class action suits. But what they said, they had a very progressive director at that time. Her name was Deborah Jacob. Deborah said, Larry, what we're going to do, we're going to bundle up all these cases and we're going to put a cover letter on it and we're going to send it to the Justice Department and urge the Justice Department to investigate the Newark Police Department. And that's what they did. And justice responded and they came in, the Justice Department. In fact, they even asked uh, the People's Organization for Progress to help uh, organized community forums where they would send in representatives to listen to the people relate the various incidents they had uh, with the Newark police. Uh, that investigation is what eventually led to the, um, uh, the uh, U.S. attorney for New Jersey. His name was Paul Fishman uh, to issue his report saying that the Newark Police Department uh, did engage in the use of excessive force. It did violate people's constitutional rights. It did have an unconstitutional, racially discriminatory stop and frisk uh, effort. It was also criminally corrupt <laughs> that the gang unit was in fact uh, selling the drugs, uh, uh, using the drugs and selling the drugs that they were getting uh, uh, from the criminals and that it needed civilian oversight. But the point I'm trying to make is that from the point that it became public that the Justice Department was in Newark doing an investigation, you could actually see a change in the behavior of some of the police. It didn't mean that police brutality went away, but we interacted with the police often because we had, every time people would come to them, people were coming to us like every other week. We met weekly at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Every other week, a family was coming to us. Can you help us? You know, our son has been killed. Our son has been shot by the police and so on and on and on. 
So we interacted with the police often and we could see because they were like very hostile to us before this, you know, we would have our demonstrations and stuff. Uh, and sometimes they, they were required to cover the demonstration. Like, you know, in New York, you know, the police, <laughs> you know, they, they, they violate people's constitutional rights. They beat up the protesters. You know, in Newark, they didn't even want to cover the, the demonstrations. I mean, why do you need police coverage? Because when you march in the street, there's some crazy people that might try to hit you with their car, you know, but they were hostile. But you could see a change in their behavior. And so the presence of the Justice Department and then once the federal monitor was put into place and the consent decree was put into place, it has had an effect. The mayor, just la j just the beginning of this year, all these articles were coming out about the Newark Police Department with, went the whole year of 2020. shows that you can have an impact. The unfortunate thing was on the very first day of 2021, January 1st, 2021, a Newark police detective shot a fellow named Carl Dorsey and killed him. And then they said in the, in the newspapers, the police said Dorsey was armed, he had a gun. But, you know, we fought for this law, you know, independent uh, prosecutor bill, which got passed into independent investigations. Uh, uh, when the police kill somebody, now the state attorney general has to investigate it, not the local police department. The AG made public the video that showed that Dorsey didn't have a gun when he was shot. So I'm saying all this to say that in the final analysis, in my humble opinion. It's really not training, although they need training and we support training. We support de-escalation training. We support sensitivity training. As I said, we support body cameras and all of these things we support. But I believe that the thing that's needed most is that the police have to know that if they unjustly kill someone, if they use excessive force, if they violate people's constitutional rights, they will lose their gun, their badge, their job. They might lose their pension. And if they're convicted, they'll lose their freedom. To me, that is the most potent deterrent to police brutality. Oh, man. We have a, a question that came in. Thank you, Larry, by the way. <laughs> we have a question that came in and I'll read it. And um, uh, we'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, have some police review boards been established in other US cities and have they had a positive effect? Yes, there are police review boards in other cities. There are police review boards that have subpoena power the police review board in New York City has subpoena power. And have they had an effect? They probably have had an effect, but they haven't stopped police brutality. In fact, New York has had police review board at least since 1966. And some of the most horrific cases of police brutality in the country have occurred in New York City, such as the Abner Louima case where he was tortured, he wasn't killed, but he was tortured in the most horrific way imaginable, you know? And then can we forget Amadou Diallo, 41 shots, or Sean Bell, 50 shots? Like, it's never like they kill the black man with one shot. It's like always, like, you know, in New Jersey, Abdul Kamal, 15 shots, Stanton Crew, 27 shots. You know, and, and on and on, like one bullet is never enough for a black person. You know, I don't, I don't understand it. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we, we need to eliminate this qualified immunity that police have. They continue to do it because they know they can evade prosecution. They know they can get away with it. I mean, just go back, go back on Facebook, 
get the video of Derek Chauvin killing George Floyd. Look at Chauvin's face. Does he look like a man that's worried about anything? That he's like concerned, like what's going to happen after this is all over? No, he looks like he has the face of someone who's doing something that's pretty routine. And we have found out that it was routine in Chauvin's life. That in fact, Chauvin is going to go on trial for the killing of, of a 17 year old that I believe allegedly he beat with a flashlight. So, you know, while all of these other things help, you know, like my mother used to tell me, uh, he used, she used to say, Larry, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. <laughs> you know, so we, we support the little things, but don't overlook the big thing. Don't overlook the elephant in the room uh, in a mad scramble to get all these little things done. The elephant in the room is that the police have to know that if they kill unjustly, that they will be prosecuted. You know, maybe we should start making the police pay for these settlements rather than the municipalities. Maybe if the police knew that their pension money might be attached to some multi-million dollar settlement they would be less uh, willing to, in fact, uh, uh, do the, these horrific killings. And the police kill a lot of people in America. Hey, Larry, uh, explain, Larry, explain to us exactly what qualified immunity does to, for the police. Right. Qualified immunity is actually not a law. It is a precedent uh, set by court rulings that says that if a policeman commits an act while in fact he's in the act of carrying out his duty as an agent, as an officer of the city or as an agent of the state, as some people would say, then in fact, he has a degree of immunity. Not, it's not absolute immunity because just like the corporate veil, qualified immunity can be pierced under uh, certain circumstances, but it gives them a measure of immunity from prosecution that the average citizen does not have. You know, um, there's qualified immunity and then there's uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, that is a kind of absolute uh, immunity that uh, if he's acting under color of law, as they say, you hear lawyers use, was, was he acting under color of law? Uh, then uh, he was carrying out his duties uh, for the municipality that he was working for. These things play a role in uh, keeping police from being convicted, you know, but they can still be convicted and they are, you look at the Faison case, qualified immunity couldn't, you know, save them. But see, it only uh, really works. I mean, it, 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 we're only able to overcome qualified immunity when the evidence is so, so, so overwhelming. I mean, like George Floyd, it was on, you saw the murder, right? And even sometimes, I mean, witness Rodney King. We had a video. I mean, that was like the first video. That was the first awakening. I mean, that caused the whole city of Los Angeles to explode in an uprising, the Rodney King case. But those officers weren't convicted in the Rodney King case. And that was on, on the video. This is why we need laws to eliminate all of this immunity from prosecution, be it qualified immunity, be it sovereign immunity, be it acting under color of law, you know, they got to know if they do wrong, they're going to receive the same punishment that a citizen would. There can't be two standards of justice. There has to be one standard of justice for everybody. And this is why the police in America, I, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but in the, in the past year, the police have killed about 1,500 people in the past year. Um, the police in America kill about 1,000 people every year. Now a disproportionate number of them are black. 
This is why people see police brutality as a black problem, you know, because uh, about 35% of the 1,000, which would be 330 something, I guess, of the 1,000 people, uh, 300 or so are black. We're only 13% of the population, but the police kill people of all races. They kill white people. They're white people who are the victims of police brutality. They kill Latinos, they kill Asians. And one of the highest rates of police brutality is on Native American reservations. It may, in some instances, is higher than the rate, uh, police brutality rate uh, among black people, Native Americans. Uh, so they kill people of all races. It's just that we get a disproportionately higher, a higher brunt of it, but they do kill people of all races. That's why I try to convey to people that this isn't a black problem. This is an American problem, you know, and we, and we got to get a handle on it. Like real, like right now, <laughs> you know, is there another question? Jeff, you, you have a question? So I think we are, we're just about done. Oh, well, the, the one, one of our uh, people in the audience uh, is asking, what can the police do to re-earn the respect and support of the community? Oh, what? <laughs> Stop killing people. <laughs> you know, that's what they could do. Um, I, 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 to be truthful, you know, I was a district leader. Uh, Y'all know what a district leader, like Essex County Democratic Committeemen. They're Republican district leaders and Democratic district leaders. Every city is divided into wards and those wards are divided into districts. And each district is supposed to have a male and female uh, um, district leader, Democratic district leader and a male and female Republican if they have Republicans. And I'm going to tell you, Crime is a major concern of people in the community. Crime is a major concern of people in the community. I remember when I came home from school, that is when I moved back to Newark from Princeton after doing two years of graduate work. When I came back, um, I picked up the newspaper and the Valesburg Lock Association president was in the newspaper saying that he wanted the National Guard to come to Newark. Now, this is the people that were under military occupation by the National Guard. Now, there were some people calling for the National Guard come back into Newark because there was a crime wave in the Valesburg area, which is the West Ward of Newark. Um, there, are pe there are people in the community that don't have a negative view of the police. Uh, there are people in the community that do have a negative view of the police. All black people don't see the police the same way, but I think most black people, a, a vast majority, want police brutality to end. And the thing that police could do is stop engaging in those kinds of things that cause folks to mistrust the police. But I don't think that's going to happen voluntarily. I don't think there's going to be some kind of moral epiphany the police are going to have and they're going to wake up one morning and say, I'm going to stop doing these things. You know, I think it's really going to take a radical transformation of policing uh, in the United States. And that's going to be a long haul. I think we're going to get some of these things like we've gotten some of them already. Uh, but even like with the body cams, all the police in New Jersey don't have body cams. All the police, even some some municipalities that said they would get body cams, they haven't gotten them yet. And then some of them only using them on an experimental basis. They, they, it's a, what do they call a, a demo, a demonstration project? You know, they put on body cams on a few police and so see how that works. So, you know, we should continue to call for these things like uh, no ending no-knock warrants. That's how the police broke into Breonna Taylor's house with a no-knock warrant. Do you know how many cases there have been where police use no-knock warrants to enter people's homes and they weren't even at the right house and they kill people in that house? 
they weren't even in the right house. So we need to end these no knock warrants. Uh, we, we need to um, end chokeholds like every town should outlaw these chokeholds where the police can choke people to death, chokeholds and the no knock warrants, police review boards. I think every town should have one and should have those. But I what think ultimately, I'm what are sorry. your thoughts? I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. What are yeah, your please. thoughts on, 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 on abolition defunding and what happened in, in, with the Camden Police Department? Is Camden a model that maybe we should look at? Well, in general, I support defunding. I support the call for abolition. But I support the call for abolition like I support the call for socialism. It's a long-term goal. The police are not going to be abolished in our lifetime. It might happen sometime in the future that we live in peace with one another and we don't need police forces. We can handle it ourselves. But every country on the face of the earth right now has some form of police. But I support it as a, you know, abolition as a long range goal, the abolition of police, the abolition of prisons. So I, I support it. And, and if you look at reality, even the people who are calling for these things, if, even if they don't admit to it, it's a gradual process that they're engaged in. They, they support reforms that take them down the path toward the ultimate goal of abolition. Uh, I support defund, defunding, but I don't use the term defunding. I use the term reallocate. You know, and Mayor Baraka has done this last summer. He took 5% of um, the police budget uh, and reallocated it. In fact, he's supposed, they're supposed to be in the process of turning the 17th Avenue precinct, which I talked about earlier, which was where the Newark Rebellion of 67 started and they're gonna turn it into a social service uh, center and a museum dedicated to the Newark uprising of 1967. So, you know, I don't, I don't criticize the people who use defunding or use abolition, um, but I, um, I myself uh, don't use those terms because, you know, I try to be more uh, direct in, in, in my approach to the problem. And any thoughts about Camden? And because uh, oh, essentially they, yes. Camden, well, Camden is an interesting um, phenomenon. You know, I, I'm not so sure that I'm in, I'm in, I'm in support of uh, what they did in Camden because they fired the whole police department. Then they had everybody reapply for their jobs. Uh, everybody that was fired was not rehired and they turned the Camden police into Camden Metro, which is now like under the county and not under the municipal government of Camden. And I have problems with that. You know, I, I'm, I believe in home rule, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just like state takeover, you know, only they took over the police department, you know, and ultimately it's outside of the hands of um, the people that live in Camden. Now it's for the people in Camden to determine what's best for them. You know, I'm not going to Camden to campaign against what they're doing. Uh, whatever the people of Camden want, that's what they should fight for. But um, I think the way it was done in Camden is problematic, just like state takeover of the schools in Newark. I thought, I always felt that state takeover was a violation of the constitutional rights of the people of Newark. You know, how can uh, the state uh, take over the schools of black districts and not take over the schools in white districts? How can they take over the schools of black districts where students are not doing well 
and not take over white districts where students are not doing well. There are white districts, you know, there's inequality among white communities too. It might not be as sharp as the inequality between black and white, but there's inequality there. And uh, I always thought that that was a, a violation, especially when they took it over after the board became an elected board. I thought that was a violation of people's voting rights. That's why I say constitutional rights, but more specifically people's voting rights. How can you let white people elect their school boards and not let black people elect their school boards? Or, let, or worse yet, even worse, let them elect the school board, but whatever the school board decides can be overturned by the state appointed superintendent. I mean, it, it looked like it looked like colonial rule there in Newark for a minute. You you had uh, the last super the last state superintendent was white. You had this black school board that was elected, but the the white colonial administrator could overrule whatever the school board was doing. You know, but I guess nobody uh, uh, had the wherewithal to really challenge it. I mean, if 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 I had had the money you know, and the, and the resources, I would have got a law firm to go in there and challenge it and say, you know, this is this looks like a violation of people's constitutional rights. But they got away with it because they were the state of New Jersey. You know, it had, it had the color of law. <laughs> Speaking of the color of law, right? This was done under the color of law, under the authority of the state of New Jersey, the authority of the governor and the state legislature. But just because the governor and state legislature do something doesn't make it right. If it made it right, we wouldn't have had all these civil rights cases because segregation was the law. The law of the state legislature signed by the governors over these years. You know, so um, I think uh, I, I, would, I don't see if it's working for the people of Camden, fine, but I wouldn't hold it up as a model because it really undermines whole rule, home rule. I mean, what else did they take over in Camden? They took over the police. What else? They finances. <laughs> they took, the state came in and took over running the city's finances. You know, it's like Black people can get home rule, but home rule is always in danger because they could come in and take it over, you know, and use use mismanagement. They use malfeasance and look how many examples of corruption we have in white suburbs. How many people, uh, elected officials and administrators from white suburbs who've been convicted of in corruption cases around the state, but they didn't take the, the people's right to run their city away from them or the right to control their finances away from them. They just convicted those individuals. That's right, in, Ch in Camden, uh, wasn't part of the reasoning to get out from under the thumb of the police union. And, well, and, and, and it, it, it may it it may have been. I don't know. Um, I really can't speak authoritatively uh, to, to, at that level of but, granularity, but the, as they the role, say. The power of police unions. Uh, right. Let, 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 let me say something about police unions. I'm not against the police having unions. I think all working people have a right to have unions. I think the police have a right to have a union. The problem is, is that the police have used their power to accrue to themselves things that really should be under the law and not under their not in their contract. For instance. Why do police, why do the police have the power to wait 48 hours before they can even be asked about what they did? Like that's in their contract. Like if I go out here and kill somebody, you can believe that if I'm caught, I'm going to be interrogated as soon as they bring me into the police precinct or the police station. The police have in their contract, they got a 48 hour rule. They don't have to talk to anybody for 48 hours. That shouldn't be in the contract. I think that they have things in their contract should, that should be a matter of law and should be the prerogative of the municipality, not the prerogative of the police union.
I'm not against unions, the police having unions per se. I think they have a right to collective bargaining, just like all workers have a right to collective bargaining. But what they have in their contracts go beyond collective bargaining. It, it, it goes into superseding the law, <laughs> you know, giving them a power to do things that they shouldn't have the power to do. Larry, we have a, an, another question. We have actually three other people that uh, had questions. Uh, uh, Amy had a question. She said, please repeat the three bills that you are trying to get passed in the New Jersey uh, legislature. Uh, subpoena power for civilian power. I'm sorry, subpoena power for civilian police review boards, elimination of qualified immunity for police. And what was the third? The third one was records transparency. Okay, thank you. And that was uh, the third. record transparency, Amy. Right, um, right. Perfect. And uh, Andrea asked, do you believe in dismantling the police? <sighs> if I had the power, first of all, it, it, I think it's idealistic to think that we can dismantle the police forces. Like anybody running for office, like if we were to have a municipal election right now, anybody running for office who said, if you elect me mayor, I'll dismantle the police. That person is not going to be elected mayor of that city. Now, I don't, I would not, you wouldn't see me stand if I was at a rally and somebody said we should dismantle the police. I wouldn't challenge them at the rally. I mean, that's like an aspirational goal. But I, I don't I think that we have to be realistic and not idealistic. Most munis I can't think of a municipality that does not have at least one police officer in the United States. There's some pretty small towns, so they might have one officer. Or there's some towns that might be so small that they might not have police. They have a county sheriff. That, that may exist. But most cities and towns have a police department. And they have it for a reason, you know, because people want to feel safe. The problem is, is that the police who are sworn to protect and serve are not protecting and serving certain communities. That's the problem. But if if people are saying dismantle the police, I'm not, you're not gonna see me out there um, objecting to it, but it's not a slogan that I personally, Larry Ham, is gonna raise because it, it's not gonna have broad political support. I, I look forward to a day in, in humanity when we won't need police and we won't need prisons you know, and everybody lives in peace. And when people have disputes, they're able to resolve them in a non-antagonistic way. But I do not believe that that is going to happen in my lifetime. In fact, truth to tell you the truth that's on my heart right now, I actually think things are gonna get worse before they get better. Because right now the police have aligned themselves. There's really a kind of, fascist united front in the United States right now. It's the Republican Party. It's the, the gun people, the NRA, and their ilk. A lot of police, a lot of military individuals. It's not necessarily the organizations per se, but it's certainly the police unions. I mean, look, the, all the police, remember when Trump and Biden had their first debate, what did Trump say to Biden? Trump, in one, one instance where he told the truth, the, 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 the Washington Post said Trump told 30,000 lies during the course of his administration. But one night he did tell one truth. And when he said to Biden, he said, Biden, all the police have endorsed me. And he was right. He told the truth. All the police, the police, the P, the FOP, the 332 
thousand member FOP endorsed Donald Trump in 2016. And after four years of Trump, they came back and endorsed him in 2020. I believe the police unions are part of this fascist united front in this country. The, it, it includes the Klan and the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists and the neo-Confederates of all stripes and the anti-Semites and the racists of all stripes. There's a, there's a united front and they have more power today than they have had in decades. They are electing these right wing I, I, you know, I'm tempted to say nutcases, but they really not nuts. They're evil. <laughs> if they were just nuts, it'd be one thing. But these people are not crazy. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. This is why we got 43 states that have in, that have had introduced in their state legislatures 400 different bills to suppress voter turnout. We got 18 states where bills have been introduced to limit and circumscribe political protests. We're getting these QAnon people elected to the, to the Congress, to state legislatures, to school boards. And we got a rise in racist violence against people of color, against Jewish people, and other people and women and other people in this country. And it's not just a national phenomenon. This is a worldwide phenomenon. I was just watching last night, and I know this is not on the subject, but I was watching a video last night. Uh, they, they got, it looks like a Nazi movement has taken power in Poland. I mean, are, are y'all following some of these things that are going on? In, in, in Europe, Orban, in Hungary, uh, this other guy in Brazil, I can't, I'm not having a senior moment right now, I can't remember the president of Brazil's uh, um, uh, name, but the, what's his name? Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro, yeah. Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the US, all over the world, these right wing ultra nationalists, that's really... See, the media doesn't want to say racist. They don't want to say neo-Nazis. So they'll say things like white nationalists and ultra-nationalists. These people are Nazis <laughs> and neo-Nazis. You know, all over the world. So, Larry, all over the world. Mr. Ham, you, you yes. know, uh, we're going to have to set up a second session. You, you, <laughs> you, 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 you don't want me to bore people to death, do you? Yes, I do. This this was uh, this is very enlightening. Uh, I just wanted to, on behalf of Diversity United and our audience, thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, for sharing with us, but also your your genuine, authentic efforts for your community over the years. So it's very, very, very impressive. Uh, that's what resonates with me. Uh, so thank you. And, you know, we're, uh, this is a year long program when, when Mildred gets back on her feet, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be another opportunity that you might want to sit in on with us. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, I'm yes. sorry, Eric, but could I just jump in and ask one practical question? Sure. Uh, Larry, could you tell us what groups are doing this kind of work in Newark and Essex County and North Jersey and how people can link up with those groups and also give us a little more info on Monday's rally and how we can sign up for the bus right, right down there? Right. Well, there, there are a whole bunch of groups that are doing work around the issue of police brutality. Certainly the ACLU. I mean, the, the ACLU is really um, under under <laughs> underestimated. I don't know if the right word is underestimated. What I'm trying to say is they don't get the recognition that they really should. The ACLU is doing great work and doing great work around the issue of police brutality. That's one group. Another group, you had their leader on a couple of weeks ago, Ryan Haygood, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice is doing good work around the issue of police brutality, particularly around the issue of lobbying 
and trying to get these legislators to pass these bills. Um, another group, the traditional NAACP. You know, NAACP does good work. Believe it or not, even though I'm the president of the People's Organization, I'm the chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, I am also a member of several, believe it or not, don't ask me how it happened, but I'm a member of several NAACP chapters. And when we try to do uh, coalition work, uh, we, we always try to include uh, the NAACP. Um, the New Jersey, what is that? The New Jersey Public Policy Institute. Uh, that's another group. And, and I could go on for, for days uh, naming these groups, but th those are some of, those are just a handful of the many groups that are doing work around uh, the issue of police brutality. Uh, for the rally, the rally is Monday, um, June 21st, Monday, June 21st at 12 noon. Uh, in front of the, not actually the State House Annex, which is the building right next to the State House. I believe the State House is still under renovation. So the state legislature will be in session, the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, they will be in session having committee hearings on Monday the 21st. And we're going to rally on the steps of the State House Annex and call for the passage of these bills. Uh, that I have mentioned uh, to you tonight, particularly the police review board with subpoena power bill. Now we're gonna have a bus. Uh, the ACLU is gonna have a bus, uh, I think leaving from in front of their office and we're gonna have a bus leaving from city hall around 11, 11 a.m. Uh, leaving from city hall to go to Trenton. Um, and so we invite people to get on the buses with us uh, to go down there. Uh, we will ask people to wear masks on the bus. Uh, if, if we're able to kind of space people out, we will. I would urge people who are not vaccinated not to get on the bus, but to come down by car or come down, down by train. Uh, we don't want anybody to end up, <laughs> you know, getting COVID because they got on the bus uh, with us. But it's not a long ride. You know, uh, last year, Pop didn't go to the March on Washington because we were very concerned about the transmission of COVID. And, and, and you know, we were, we were kind of ambivalent, but the main thing that kept us from going uh, to Washington uh, last August was the fact that the ride was so long. It's like a usually go down there quicker than you come back. You know, you can get down there in like four and a half, four, four and a half hours. It usually takes about five hours to get back because people make a stop, you know, we, to for refresh themselves and to eat. And because we were going to be on that bus so long, we said, no, maybe this is not a good idea. A lot of other people did go, you know, and, you know, good for them, <laughs> you know. But uh, the, the ride to Trenton is basically, the people who've driven to Trenton know it's about an hour and 15 minutes to get to Trenton, you know, an hour and 15 down, hour and 15 back. So if you're going to come, wear your mask, you know, and, uh, and we will practice social distancing. So as, as, as a warm-up uh, to that, I believe there is a, a rally, a march planned this Saturday in Newark. Yes. For, for yes, June uh, the, yes, this Saturday, uh, there will be a march for reparations for African Americans, a march and rally. That will start uh, Saturday is Juneteenth, by the way. I didn't talk about Juneteenth tonight. I was trying to stay on the subject. I know I was going all over the place. That's all right. uh, but Saturday is Juneteenth, June 19th, 18th, uh, 60, I believe it was 1863 when General Granger rode into Texas and announced the Emancipation Proclamation and the freeing, uh, he, he, he rode into Galveston, Texas, as a matter of fact. Remember that song? It used to be a song, Galveston. And I, I won't sing, I can't sing. But uh, General Granger uh, rode in, the Union Army rode it because you know, Texas was a slave state. It, it was gonna be a slave republic because you remember when they first broke away from Mexico, they established a republic. 
And you know why they broke away from Mexico, right? Because Mexico didn't have slavery. And the Texans wanted to, you know, keep slavery. That's why they broke away. And um, uh, it was a slave state. It was a republic and a state. And Granger came in and said, you're free. Um, and that's why they celebrate uh, Juneteenth. Now Juneteenth is celebrated across the country, but initially for many years, it was celebrated primarily in the Southwest. Now I'm going to say this, I, I'm, I'm going to celebrate Juneteenth, but I have, uh, again, I'm, I'm a contrarian. <laughs> you know, I can never just accept the, the Juneteenth is not when slavery was abolished in the United States. The Emancipation Proclamation did not abolish all slavery. It only abolished slavery for those men that could escape from their masters and join the Union Army. The Emancipation Proclamation was a military recruitment document and it only applied to the states, parishes, and counties of the Confederacy. So. You remember, there were Southern states like Tennessee, I believe, that were part of the Union. And they were able to keep slavery. Remember, that, that there was slavery was still in the North. Even though uh, slavery did not get abolished in the United States until the passage of the 13th Amendment. And then that's only the abolition of chattel slavery. Remember, the 13th Amendment did not end all slavery. If you read it, it says, except for those people convicted of crimes. So when you're convicted of a crime in the United States, you're essentially enslaved. You have no rights. And that's by virtue of the 13th, the very, the very amendment that, end, that ended chattel slavery is the amendment that in fact enabled the re-enslavement of millions of black people who are incarcerated today. Yeah, uh, that, that, is, that is stunning. Our first, the first uh, documentary, documentary we watched that Diversify United was the 13th. Just, yes. just seeing the 13th yes. of many you know, of them. 13th, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I was clueless, but it's, it's right there, you know. Uh, it's breathtaking, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, it's breathtaking. But, but uh, you know, you get it. obviously we're learning. Uh, you know, this is our four, this is our fourth program, and uh, I I can't thank you enough. Uh, the goal is the goal is for us to uh, learn and, and get engaged. But but you know we have to we have to have a grasp of the underlying issues. And I I think tonight you gave us a, a really good understanding of of the issues with law enforcement at policing. I mean, anybody, anybody who watched the untold story of Emmett Till, uh, oh. I, you know, ha, what, what I can't shake, I watched that last spring and I, every day I cannot shake this idea of, you know, what's the first thing I do or you do if, if something unsettling happens in your neighborhood or outside your front door, you run to the phone and you call the cops and not not only do you expect a, a response, you, you demand it. They work for you, and and you watch that movie and the desperation that that African Americans had. To yes, go was just beyond. Uh, uh, I I watched it today, and even today, as many times as I have watched documentary documentaries about Emmett Till it brought tears to my eyes today this day this day it still brought to and you know what else we always observe August 28th as the anniversary of the March on Washington but from now on I'm going to say the anniversary of the death of Emmett Till too because that's why they had to march on Washington on August 28th because that was the day that Emmett Till was killed yeah, I mean, Mamie, Mamie Till, his mother, who's just incredibly uh, calm. I mean, she's she's like uh, the, the hero of the civil rights movement. I mean, I, yes. you know, I, I, you know no, none of us can fathom, obviously, what that must be like. But to have the sense sense of mind to have an open casket and what that would what what that would do 
It, it's just it's Man. remarkable. But anyhow, I would like to, to our audience, uh, before everyone leaves, thank you, thank you, thank you to Stephanie and Jeffrey uh, behind the scenes. Uh, thanks, thanks for everything. Uh, really well done. I, I, I don't know if Mildred or somebody in Mildred's family uh, uh, can hear this, but, you know, Mildred, you're on our, you're on our mind every day. Uh, I, you know, full and speedy recovery. Uh, we can't, we greatly look forward to you rejoining us. Uh, next month, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to expand our knowledge base. Next month, we're going to tackle housing, inequities in housing. We have uh, Mr. James Williams, who is the Director of Racial Justice at the Fair Share Housing Center. Uh, he, he will be addressing us and there'll be uh, uh, something, something that we could look at or listen to ahead of that. But, you know, redlining, uh, uh, you know, the highway system, a lot of those issues that, like me, if you grew up in the burbs, you don't, re I don't really have a great handle on. That's, he's going to talk about the Mount Laurel decision and how that affects us uh, until today. So I just, uh, again, Larry, uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, till, the, till the next time, uh, uh, you know, and th thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, addressing us. Thank you so much. Bye.